Good morning, dear students. Today we are going to solve May June 2013 one two paper. It's an MCQ paper. The syllabus we are studying is Physics 5054. My name is Farhan Mazar. Let's start today's paper. Okay. So let me reduce the size so you can see all of them. So, forces of three Newton and four Newton, forces of three Newton and four Newton act as shown in the diagram. So here we have a force of three Newton and a force of uh, four Newton. Which diagram shows the resultant R of these two forces? So these two forces, three Newton and four Newton, we want to add them and remember their, um, these two forces, their tails are joined together. The diagram they have shown us, their tails are joined. And when their tails are joined, we can apply the parallelogram law. And for that purpose, let me show you my work. I've done this. Okay, so on your screen, you can see clearly that uh, the three Newton force and four Newton force, these were given. The angle here is 90 degree. So what we did, we completed the parallelogram. We suppose that these two are the adjacent sides of a parallelogram and we completed uh, a parallelogram. Then where this, the tails of these two vectors were joined together, we joined that uh, vertex with the opposite vertex of the parallelogram. I have joined it with the blue color line here. I have written here R, this represents the resultant. This is the parallelogram law of adding the two vectors. So this diagram, wherever you find this diagram, that is the answer. So if you look at there, so A is the choice. Question number one, A is the right choice. I hope that you have understood it. So sir, so this A is the right choice. I hope that you have understood and you, you know that what is the parallelogram law of adding the two vectors. You must have studied in physics and you also have studied it in your physics, uh, in your mathematics. Okay, on your, on your screen, we have question number two. Before marking the, the finishing line on a, uh, on a running track, a groundsman measure out its 100 meter length. Which instrument is the most appropriate for this purpose? You know, if you want, to measure a length which is approximately 100 meter, the best instruments will be the measuring tape or you can use the trundle wheel. So we look at the options given to us, which instrument is the most appropriate for this purpose. A is a measuring tape, definitely measuring tape can be, could be used. A meter will know, a 30 centimeter ruler know, a micrometer know. So A is the best option. Question number two, A is the right option. Question number three, a speed time graph for a falling sky diver is shown below. As he falls, the sky diver spreads out his arms and legs and then opens his parachute. Which parachute, which part of the graph shows the sky diver falling with terminal velocity? You know, it's a speed time graph. When you fall with the terminal velocity, your velocity becomes constant. So on the speed time graph, the constant velocity is represented with a flat line, with a line whose slope is zero, with a horizontal line. So in the part D, you know the speed time graph has become flat, it has become horizontal, its, its slope is zero, its gradient is zero. It means the velocity or the speed of the body has become constant. So D represents the part of the graph where the sky faller, the skydiver is falling with the terminal velocity. So D is the option. Question number three, D is the option. Question four, the diagram shows the speed time graph of the motion of a car for four seconds. You know, it's a speed time graph. On the Y axis, the speed is represented. And on the X axis, the time is represented. 
the graph of uh, the travel is uh, in the shape of a trapezium. Here are, these are the two palisades. This is one palisade, which is of one centimeter, and this is the pa uh, one second, sorry. And this palisade, this is of four seconds, and this is the height of the trapezium, that's 10 meter per second. If you know that you must have learned that the, the area under the speed time graph is equals to the distance traveled. Area under the speed time graph is equals to the distance traveled. So we can find the area of this under this graph. This is the shape of a trapezium. The formula for the area of the trapezium is one by two into height of the trapezium into sum of the parallel sides. I've done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. Okay, so you can see on your graph, on your paper. I hope that you can see that. Increase, let's increase the size a little bit. There's more visible to you. Okay, the area under the graph is equals to one by two into height into sum of parallel sides. So one by two into 10 into four plus one, and the answer will be 25 meters. So the distance traveled by the object is 25 meter distance traveled is 25 meters so b is the option question number four b is the right option sir okay on your screen we have question number five a car of mass 1500 kg travels along a horizontal road it accelerates steadily from 10 meter per second to 25 meter per second in five seconds what is the force needed to produce this acceleration? You know, the force is equal to MA. The mass is given, but the acceleration we have to calculate first. So the first step in this question is we will, we will calculate what is the acceleration. You know, the acceleration formula is V minus U divided by T, where V is the final velocity, U is the initial velocity, and T is the time taken to change, to bring that change in the velocity. So A is equals to V minus U divided by T. So A will be equals to 25 minus 10 divided by five. Once you get the value of the acceleration, then you can apply the Newton second law. F is equals to MA. We know the mass, if we know the acceleration, we can multiply them and we can calculate how much force is needed. I have done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. On your screen, question number five, A is equals to V minus U equals to 25 minus 10 divided by five equals to three meter per second square. So this is the first step. We just calculated the acceleration. Then we will apply the Newton's second law of uh, motion. F is equals to MA. 1500 is the mass into the three is the acceleration. You multiply them, you get 4,500 Newton. So the force needed is 4,500 Newton. So 4,500 Newton, uh, C is the right option. Sir, 4,500 for question number five, C is the right option. Dear students, question six is on, on your screen. Balanced forces are acting on a moving body. The forces are balanced and the body is moving. The forces are balanced and the body is moving. What happens to the direction of the movement and to the speed of the body? If the forces are balanced, the body will continue moving with the constant speed in the same direction. That's Newton's first law of motion. If the forces are balanced and the body is moving, the body will continue moving in the same direction with the constant speed. So the direction of the movement, it will not change, do not change, does not change, and the speed it will does not it does not change so for question number six d looks the right option sir d is the right option question six question seven is on your screen a particle p is moving in a horizontal circle with o sorry a particle p is moving in a horizontal circle a circle about o P moves at constant speed, which statement is true? You know, when the object is moving in a circular track, and for example, if we observe the object when it is at position P, the direction of the motion will be tangential. The direction of the resultant force will be always toward the center of the circle. 
the direction of the acceleration will be also towards the center of the circle. Direction of the motion is this tangential direction. Direction of the velocity is also in this tangential direction. Which statement is true? A force of constant size x on p in the direction of motion, that's wrong, not in the direction of motion. A force of constant size x on p towards o, that's true. The force on p varies in size as it moves around the circle because the body is moving at a constant speed, so we don't think that the speed is varying. There is no resultant force acting on the P. No, when you move in a circle, definitely a resultant force acts on you. So B looks the right answer, a constant a force of constant size X on P towards O. So B is the right option. Question number seven, B is the right option. Okay, question number eight is on your screen. A measuring cylinder contains 20 centimeter cube of water. A stone is placed in, in the water and the water level rises to 38 centimeter cube. What is the volume of the stone? You know, uh, when there was uh, no stone in the measuring cylinder, the reading was 30, uh, 20 centimeter cube, that is V1. And when we submerge the stone, the reading on the mining cylinder is 38 centimeter cube. So the volume of the stone is equals to V2 minus V1. So 38 minus 20 and 18 centimeter cube is the answer. So the volume of the stone is 18 centimeter cube for question number eight. A is the option. I hope you have understood this. It's a famous question. Question number nine, which chair is the least stable if the child moves? The stability depends upon the base area and the height of the center of the gravity. If the base area is small and the center of gravity is very high, the thing will become least stable. So A figure looks the st least stable because the center of the gravity is very high and the base area is smaller. So the least stable A is the option. A is the right option for question number nine. Question number 10 is on your screen. The graph shows extension load curves for four fibers. Which fiber is the hardest to stretch over the range of loads shown? Here on the y-axis we have shown extension and on the x-axis we have shown loads. So take any load, for example, if I take this load, the extension produced on D is very small, the C is large, more than D, and on B it's more than D and C, and on A it's even more than D, C, and B. So you see if you apply a load from the graph, I can tell you if I applied I apply the load, same load on all of them, the smallest extension will be in the D. So it looks that the D is hardest to stretch. So D is hardest to stretch. So D is the option, sir. Question 11, four beakers contains the same liquid. At which point is the pressure greatest? You know the pressure of a liquid, the formula is rho G H, where rho is the density. If the, all the materials are same, all the liquids are the same. So what will happen? They will have the same density. So the formula for the pressure rho G H, where G is the gravitational field strand, that is also the same for all of them. And H is the depth of the liquid above the point where you want to find out the pressure. So because the density in all of them is same, same liquid in all of them, the gravitational field strength because they are in the same, same room, G value is also same for all, all of them. The only difference is now the depth of the liquid above the point where you want to find out the pressure. So depth of the liquid is largest in C. So it will have the largest pressure, greatest pressure. So for question number 11, C is the option. C is the right option. Question number 12 is on your screen. And an airtight container holds a fixed mass of gas. Its pressure and volume are measured on four occasions when the temperature is 20 degrees centigrade. The results are shown in the table. Three sets of readings are correct. Which set of reading is not correct? The question is, which set of reading is not correct? You know, 
he's talking about the pressure of a gas and he says the temperature is kept constant at 20 degrees centigrade so the formula p1 v1 p equals to p2 v2 should hold it means that the product of the pressure and the volume should remain constant let's calculate the pressure and the volume product so multiply the pressure one and the volume one multiply the pressure two and the volume two pressure three and the volume three pressure four and the volume four and check which one has a different answer okay i've done this on a paper let me show you that question number 12 is on your screen you see p1 v1 p2 v2 p3 v3 p4 v4 i did the calculation and the a has a different answer the rest of the product is of the pro product of the pressure and the volume is constant but in the option a the product of pressure and volume is different from the rest of the three so it's not correct so a is the right option which set of reading is not correct so a is not correct a is the right answer sir a is the option for question 12. Question number 13 is on your screen. A swimmer dives into a very deep pool at high speed. He slows down as he moves towards the bottom of the pool. What is the overall energy transformation as the diver moves downward to the water? So as the diver goes down, his kinetic energy and, uh, and his potential, gravitational potential energy, they are converting into thermal energy. It's a very simple thing. Kinetic energy plus the gravitational potential energy, they both are going into the thermal energy. So C looks the right option, sir. Question number 13, C is the right option. Question number 14 is on your screen. A lorry of mass 10,000 kg takes 5,000 kg of sand to the top of a hill, 50 meter high, up unloads the sand and then returns to the bottom of the hill. The gravitational field strength is 10 Newton per kg. What is the overall gain in the potential energy? You know, the trolley itself, the lorry itself went to the top of the hill and then came back. So it's gravitational potential energy um, got increased and then it came to the same point. So the gravitational potential energy uh, of the lorry is not important here. He unloaded the sand there. So the sand is the only thing which actually got at the end, actually got the increase in the gravitational potential energy. So we will only calculate the rise in the gravitational potential energy of the sand. The, tr the lorry came back, so that's why I'll ignore the lorry. So the uh, gravitational potential energy, the formula, you know, is MGH. The formula of the gravitational potential energy gain is equals to MGH where M is the mass of the sand, G is the gravitational field strength, whose value is 10 Newton per kg, and H is the vertical height gained by the sand, that is 50 meters. So just apply the formula, do the calculation, I've done this on a paper also. Question number 14 is on your screen, potential energy is equals to MGH equals to 5,000 multiplied 10, multiply 50, and the answer is 2, uh, two five and zero 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 joules okay one two three four five six so it's 2.5 raised to power six 2.5 x per six joules 2.5 x per six joules so this is the answer c is the right answer question number 14 c is the option Question 15 is on your screen. The diagram shows the energy transfer through a machine. So here we have an input energy, then the machine, some useful output energy, and some energy is wasted. The machine is 50% efficient. A 50% efficient machine, uh, efficient machine, it means that uh, if you put uh, 100 joule of energy into it, so the useful output energy will be 50 joules and the wasted energy will be also 50 joules let's say we can consider an example for example you put a 20 joule input energy and the useful output energy will be 10 and the wasted energy will be also 10. 50 percent efficient means that the half of the energy goes wasted and half of the energy goes into useful work which equation is correct 
wasted energy is equal to useful output energy d is the right option for question number 15 d is the right option that useful energy is equal to useful uh, sorry wasted energy is equal to the useful output energy d is the right option for 50 percent efficient machine You have to decrease the size so you can see the whole question. Two identical metal plates are painted, one matte dull white and other matte black. These are placed at equal distances from a radiant heater as shown. The heater is turned on for five minutes. Which metal plate absorbs more energy and which metal plate emits more energy in this time? You know the black colored matte black metal plate the black color is a very good absorber and it is also a very good radiator it, uh, of the thermal energy. So the, uh, which is the, which matter plays more energy. The absorbing thing, is, uh, the absorbing function is done by the black color and the emitting thing is also done by the black color. So black, black. So A is the option. Question number 16, A is the right option. This side of the black will absorb the maximum energy, the most energy, as compared to, it will be in a, um, absorbing more energy than this white. And this side of the black will be emitting more energy as compared to this side of the white. So in both the options, the black should come. Question 17 is on your screen. A liquid in glass thermometer contains mercury. Which physical property of the mercury varies with temperature, enabling the thermometer to operate? You know, in thermometer, mercury in glass thermometer, what happens? The volume of the mercury changes when the temperature rises or falls. The volume of the mercury changes. And by this, we are able to tell how much is the temperature. So volume, question number 17, D is the right choice. D is the right choice. Okay, question number 18 is on your screen. Uh, thermal energy of 12,000 Joule is supplied to a 2 kg mass of copper. The specific heat capacity of the copper is 400 Joules per kg per degree centigrade. What is the rise in the temperature? You know when the temperature changes, the formula for the heat is Heat is equals to M C delta theta, where M heat is the amount of heat, M is the mass of the thing, and the C is the specific latent uh, specific heat capacity, and delta theta is the change in the temperature. The question is changing. If you make, let me show you how I've done. I've done this on a paper. Let me show from there. I can explain. Okay. So heat is equals to M C delta theta. If you make the delta theta the subject of the formula. The formula delta theta is equals to heat divided by M divided by C. So delta theta is equal to 12,000 divided by 2 divided by 400 and the answer will be 15. So there will be a change of 15 degree. So there will be a change of 15 degree. So A is the option. Question number 18, A is the right option. Question number 19. Using an electric kettle, 200 gram of water at 100 degrees centigrade is converted into steam at 100 degrees centigrade in 300 seconds. The specific latent heat of the steam is 2,250 2, joules per gram. What is the average electric power used? You know, the power, uh, the power will be the heat divided by time. It will be the heat divided by time. And the heat is M multiply L. Heat is M stands for the mass. L stands for the specific latent heat. So uh, heat will be mass multiply specific latent heat. It will be 200 multiplied 2250 and divided by time. That's 200 seconds. That's 300 seconds, sorry and 200 into 2250 divided by 300 and the, and the unit will be what? So B, B looks the right option, sir. Question number 19, B is the right option. I hope that you have understood it. Okay. 
So question number 20. The diagram shows a fixed mass of gas in a cylinder fitted with a piston that can move easily. So the volume is not constant, it can change. What is the change, if any, in the pressure and volume of the gas after it is heated? So you are providing heat and the volume will change. And in our course, you know, only two things changes. One thing remains constant, so the pressure should remain constant. So what will happen actually when you will heat it, the piston will move, the volume will increase, so the pressure will remain the same. So the volume will increase, the temperature will increase, but the pressure will remain the same. So pressure, no change, and the volume will increase because the piston was movable. So A looks the right answer, sir. Question number 20A is the right option. Question number 21. What happens to the molecules of a gas when the gas changes into a liquid? When the gas will change into a liquid, so it will be condensing. So the molecules will come close to each other. Obviously, they will lose their energy. Uh, they move closer and lose energy. Yes, that's the thing. They move closer and gain energy. No. They move apart and lose energy. No. They move apart and gain energy. No. So A looks the right answer. Question number 21, A is the right option. Question 22 is on your screen. Energy can be transferred in many different ways. In which situation is energy transferred by wave motion? Colliding atoms in a heated copper rod, no fast moving electrons in a fast moving electrons in a cathode ray oscilloscope, no hot water rising in a heated saucepan, no ripples, ripples, waves passing across water in a ripple tank. Yes, this is using wave motion. So D is the right option, sir. So question 22, D is the right option. Then we have question number 23 is on your screen. A wave has a frequency of 10 kilohertz. Kilohertz. Which pair of value of its speed and wavelength is possible? So here we have given speed and wavelength. And from here, we can calculate the frequency for each option. And we will see that which one will give the answer 10,000. 10 kilohertz means 10,000 hertz. So how? You know the, the wave equation is V equals to F lambda. V equals to F lambda, where V is the speed, F is the frequency, and lambda is the wavelength. So frequency is equal to V divided by lambda. So for all the four options, we will do the calculations. We will find what is the frequency of each of them. And we will see that which one of them gives the answer 10,000 hertz. I've done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. Okay, on your screen, I hope you can see for all the options A, B, C, and D, we will calculate what is the value of the frequency. We will take uh, their velocity and we will divide it with their wavelength. We call it lambda and we will get the answers. You see in the D option, the answer came, the frequency came out to be 10,000, which means 10 kilohertz. So for question number 23, you know, the D could be the answer, 10 kilohertz. D is the right option. I hope that you have understood it. So D is the option, sir. Question number 23 for a little tricky question. So pay attention. Question number 24, which of the following travels as a longitudinal wave? The sound waves are longitudinal waves, remember that. Uh, is this a radio wave in here? Radio waves are transverse waves. A sound wave in a solid? Yes, the sound waves are longitudinal. This is the option. A wave on a rope shaken from side to side is a transverse wave. An infrared wave in a space is a transverse wave. Infrareds are transverse waves. So a sound wave in a solid is the right option. B is the right option for question number 24. Question number 25 is on your screen. Which characteristic describes an image formed by a vertical plane mirror? In the plane mirror, the image formed is virtual. The image formed is upright. It's not inverted. It has the same size as that of the object. This distance from the mirror 
is equal to the distance of the object from the mirror. So look at the a real and inverted. No, it's not real. Virtual and not inverted. Yes, the image formed in the plane mirror is virtual, and it is erect. We call we also call it not inverted. B is the right option, sir. Real and larger than the object. No, virtual and smaller than the object. No. So B is the right option. Question number twenty-five. B is the option. Question number 26 is on your screen. Which length is the focal length? Focal length, you know, the line, the rays, the beam, the light rays, which are parallel to the principal axis before entering into the lens. And then it converges it on the principal focus. So where it, uh, where this line is focused on the principal axis, that point is called principal focus. And the distance between the principal focus and the optical center, that is called the focal length. So B is the representing the focal length. B is representing the focal length. So B is the right option for question number 26. What is the possible frequency of an ultrasound wave? You know, the ultrasound waves are those sound waves whose frequency is more than 20,000 Hertz. So 3K, 10K, 30K. So this is the option. This is 30,000 Hertz. It is more than 20,000 Hertz. So this is ultrasound. So D is the right option. Question number 27, D is the right option. Question number 28 is on your screen. A guitar string is made to vibrate. What makes the pitch of the note rise? The pitch depends upon the frequency. The higher the frequency, the, the pitch will be higher. A decrease in amplitude of vibration, no. A decrease in the frequency of vibration, no. An increase in the amplitude of the vibration, no. An increase in the frequency of vibration, yes. The pitch depends upon the frequency. If you want uh, to, uh, of, uh, the pitch of the note to rise, the frequency of vibration should increase. So D is the right option. Question 29, the magnetic field around one bar magnet is shown. Which diagram represents the correct arrangement of the magnet, magnetic poles? From here, you took here. The magnetic lines are coming out. Look at these arrows carefully. From here, the magnetic, so this is north. Here, the magnetic lines are going in. Yeah, so this is south. So this is north, this is south. Here the magnetic lines are coming out, so this is north. Here the magnetic lines are going in, so this is south. So these two are north and these two outsides are south. So let me reduce the size so you can see the whole thing. So C looks the right option. For question number 29, C is the right option, sir. Question 30 is on your screen. Which material is used to magnetically screen electrical equipment from unwanted magnetic fields? You know that we use soft iron for this purpose. Magnetic screening is done by the uh, soft iron. So iron is the answer. Question number 30, C is the right option, sir. Question number 31, a student rubs a rod held in his hand. Which action causes the rod to gain a large electrostatic charge? The rod should be an insulator and the, the, the thing which you are rubbing it, that should also be an insulator. So rubbing a polythene rod with a woolen duster is the right option. Both should be insulators. D is the right option. Rubbing a polythene rod with a woolen duster. So B, uh, D, D, is the right option. A lightning flash carries 40 coulomb of charge and lasts for five milliseconds. What is the average current in the flash? You know, the current, the formula for the current is the charge per unit time. I is equals to Q divided by T. I is current, Q is charge, and T is the time, but the time should be taken in seconds. So we can apply the formula I is equals to Q divided by T, and we can find how much current flows there. 
So on your screen, question number 32, you can see I is equals to Q by T, 40 Coulomb divided by 5, expo minus 3 second. You know why I wrote a minus 3 raised to power minus 3? Because we do not take time in milliseconds in this formula. We have to convert it into seconds. So 5 milliseconds mean 5 expo minus 3 seconds. So the answer is 8,000 amps. 8,000 amps. 8,000 amps. So D is the right option, sir. For 32, D is the right option. Question number 33 is on your screen. The diagram shows the current voltage graph of two filament lamps. Here is the IV graph. Here I is represented or current is represented on the Y axis and the voltage is represented on the X axis. The slope of this graph is equals to the reciprocal of the resistance. So if the slope is, uh, is because the slope is equals to the reciprocal of the uh, resistance, so whatever is happening with the slope, the opposite is happening with the resistance. For example, from here to here, the slope is constant. It means that the resistance is constant. From then, you can see the slope has gradually decreased. It means the resistance has gradually increased. So which statement is correct? Lamp P has a lower resistance than lamp Q at all current. That's not true. Uh, its slope is more here so as compared to this slope. So its resistance is higher. Lamp P has the same resistance as lamp Q at low currents. That's true. Lamp P and lamp Q in the low currents, these are the low currents, the value of the resistance for both the lamps is same in low currents. That's true. P is the right thing. Lamp P has the same resistance as lamp Q at high currents. No. When you go into the high currents, they have the different slopes. They have the different uh, resistances. Lamp uh, D option is lamp P has a higher resistance than lamp Q at all currents. At all currents is not right thing. So, sir, B is the best answer he gave you for question number 33. B is the right option. Question number 34, let me reduce the size so you can see the whole question together. Okay. A circuit containing two lamps, L1 and L2, is connected as shown. So here we have lamp one, lamp two, here we have connected the ramp meter, here we have connected a voltmeter, but the voltmeter is across lamp one. A voltmeter measures the potential difference across the lamp L1. The filament of the lamp L1 breaks. What happens to the reading on the ammeter and of the voltmeter? Try to understand this description, okay? So what right now what is happening? Uh, whatever is the EMF of the battery, some voltage is taken by this lamp and some voltage is taken by this lamp and the current coming out of the battery is also measured with this ammeter. So this ammeter is telling you how much current is coming out of the battery and going back to the battery, but this voltmeter is telling you how much is the voltage drop across the lamp one. Now what happens that the lamp one get fused? When the lamp one will get fused, the path of the current will be broken. When lamp L1 will be fused, the path of the current will be broken and what will happen? The current will stop flowing. The ammeter will show zero reading. So the reading on the ammeter has decreased because there is no more current, there is no current flowing. Before the current was flowing and now there is no current flowing. So the reading on the ammeter has decreased. Now what happened with this voltmeter? In the first situation, when everything was good, the voltmeter was uh, noting down how much voltage is being used by the lamp one. But once it gets fused, no energy is being used here. So now the voltmeter's one terminal is connected with this battery and the other terminal is connected with this battery and no electric energy is being used. So this voltmeter will start telling you what is the potential difference between the terminals of the battery. So now it will be telling you 
the EMF of the battery. So when the bulb L1 gets fused, the, the voltmeter one, which was the voltmeter which was telling you before the voltage taken by the lamp one, but when the, once the lamp one get fused, lamp one get uh, fused, the voltmeter will start telling you what is the EMF of the battery. So EMF of the battery was more than the voltage drop across the lamp one. So the reading on the voltmeter will increase. The reading on the ammeter will go down, and the reading on the voltmeter will go up. It's a little tricky story. Okay, the reading on the ammeter will decrease and the reading on the voltmeter will increase. So B is the right option. I hope you have understood this story. 34B is the right option. Okay, so on your screen, we have question number 35. In the circuits P and Q below, Resist, resistors R1, R2, and R3 have different resistances. In which circuit are the currents in the resistors equal and in which circuits are the potential difference across the resistors equal? The currents can be equal in all the resistors if they are connected in series with each other. So the currents are equal in the circuit Q. Because the current will have a single path, there is a single loop, so the current will have a single path. So the same current which came out of the battery will flow through all of them. So the current in R1, the current in R2, and the current in R3 will be equal to each other. So the cur current equal is circuit Q, and you know when you connect the resistors in parallel to each other, they will have the same potential drop. They will have the same potential difference. Voltage drop will be same. So the voltage drop or potential difference equal will be in the circuit P. Current equal in Q and the potential difference equal in P. So C looks the right option, sir. Question number 35, C is the right option. I hope you have understood it. Question number 36 is on your screen. Five electrical appliances are connected to the same socket and there is a very large current. Why is this? You know, if you connect five appliances to a single socket, the socket might not be designed for this much large current. And you know, when the amount of the current um, exceeds a certain limit, whenever the current is flowing through a wire, it has heating effect, heat is produced. So what will happen due to the heating effect, the now because the amount of current has become too large, the heating effect will uh, overheat the socket. So there is overheating in the socket. So D is the right option. Question number 36, D is the right option. On your screen, we have question number one, uh, question number 37. A wire hangs between the poles of a magnet. When there is a current in the wire, in which direction does the wire move? So it's a question on on uh, motor effect. This question, the direction of the force experienced by a current carrying conductor placed in a magnetic field can be found by Fleming's left hand rule. I'm saying Fleming's left hand rule. So what you will do, you will take your left hand, left hand, okay? Now stretch the fingers of this left hand, these three fingers of the left hand, thumb, index finger and the middle finger. Stretch them in such a way that they are perpendicular to each other. You know, they are perpendicular to each other. Stretch them in such a way, okay? So what we call them, thumb is the force, index finger is the magnetic field, and the middle finger is the current. So if you apply this here, you will see the current is going down, the magnetic field is going in this way, my thumb is pointing towards me and that is A direction. So this is how you apply the left hand rule, Fleming's left hand rule, to find the direction of the force on a, on a current carrying conductor placed in a magnetic field. So with the help of the Fleming's left hand rule, I can tell you the direction of the force experienced by this 
the current carrying conductor will be in the direction A. So A is the right option. Question number 37, A is the right option. In a darkened room, a 100 ohm resistor and a light dependent resistor, which we call LDR, are connected in series with a 12 volt power supply. The curtains are opened and light falls on the LDR. What happened to the voltage across the LDR? You know, when the light will fall on the LDR, its resistance will decrease. That's the property of the LDR. When it's in dark, its resistance is high. When light falls on it, its resistance becomes smaller. So when the light, when you open the curtains, the light falls on the LDR, the resistance of the LDR will decrease. When the resistance of the LDR will decrease, the voltage across the LDR will loss. Sorry, I said increase. When the light will fall on the LDR, the resistance will decrease. The resistance of the LDR will decrease when light falls on it. If the resistance of the LDR will decrease, the voltage drop across the LDR will also decrease. So the voltage drop across the LDR will decrease when you open the curtains and light will fall on the LDR. The, it should decrease. So A looks the option, sir. Question number 38, A is the right option. Question number 39, the count rate from a radioactive source falls from 4,000 counts per minute to 500 counts per minute in 72 minutes. What is the half-life of the source? So the, originally the count rate was 4,000 and it falls to 500 counts per minute in 72 minutes. Let me show you my work. I've done this on a paper. So here on your screen. So there was four, thousand counts per minute so when it will have two thousand counts per minute again have one thousand counts per minute and again have five hundred counts per minute you see how many half lives have passed one two three so three half lives have passed so he told us that total 72 minutes have passed so divide 72 with three and the answer will be 24 minutes. So one half life is of 24 minutes. I hope that you have understood it. It's a question on half life. I hope that you understood this grid and I hope you understand why I divided 72 with three. So the half life is 24 minutes. Half life is 24 minutes. So sir, D is the right option. I hope you have understood it. Question 40, the geiger marsden experiment, a beam of alpha particles is fired at a thin sheet of gold in a vacuum. The majority of the alpha particles pass straight through the sheet without being deflected. What does this show? You know, in this experiment, what they did, they took, they took a gold foil, a very thin gold foil, and they bombarded alpha particles on this gold foil. So what happened that when they bombarded the uh, alpha particles gold foil, most of the alpha particles went straight, undeflected. They went straight to the gold foil. They went straight as if there was nothing in their path, but there was gold foil in their path. Nothing happened to them. They went straight. And only very few of them were deflected. From there, they, they concluded that the, most of the atom is empty. But there in the atom, there is a small nucleus which has positive charge and which has, uh, which has all the mass. So they discovered that there is a nucleus which is very small. The rest of the atom is empty. So by this experiment, they covered the nucleus is very small. So D is the option, sir. Question number 40, D is the D is the right option. Okay, dear students, by this question, we have reached the end of this paper. Uh, today, we have done May, June 2013. One, two paper, it's the MCQ paper. The course we are studying is Physics 5054. My name is Farhan Mazar. And thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day.
and god bless you all thank you very much once